Hey, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to church. It's good to be together. Let's stand to our feet here in the room if you're able to. And uh, good morning to everybody making their way in from the lobby. We're excited to worship together. And also, we have our online friends and family with us this morning. I want to say a special good morning to you guys. We're so thankful you're joining us from your homes, wherever you might be. As our call to worship this morning, uh, I'm going to read to us from a familiar passage in 1 John. And uh, this is 1 John chapter 3. See, the Lord speaks to us now. He asks us to look. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. What a beautiful gift that the Lord has given his love. And he's not just given it in a little measure, but he has lavished it on us. He's poured it out on us to make us his children. And that is who we are. So let's turn to the Lord. God, we come today to worship you. And we don't come to stir up something in and of ourselves, but we come to respond to what you've already started, Lord, with your love for us. You were the first one to love us. You poured out your love on us when we were far away, when we were broken in sin. And so today we honor you with our worship, our songs, and our lives laid down. Thank you for your love. Amen.
today that Jesus proclaimed the kingdom of heaven is at hand and we believe that that's true still today that the kingdom of God is not far away but that it's come and it's still coming and it's the delight of our good father in heaven to give his children his kingdom so let's confess this over our lives over our families over this church you delight in giving us your kingdom Delight in giving us your kingdom. Delight in giving us your kingdom. Cause you're our father, we are your children. Yeah, we just believe it today. Oh, you delight in giving us your kingdom. You're a good father. Father, we are your children. Thank you, Father. Thank you, God. We're together here in this moment. The presence of the Lord, he's here with us. Just take a breath here in his presence. God, we don't want to take your presence for granted. So we acknowledge that you're here. And we acknowledge that you're holy, that you're worthy, that there's no one like you. And we offer our worship to you. There was a moment when the lights went out death had claimed its victory the king of love had given up his life the darkest day in history there on a cross they made for sinners for every curse his blood One final breath and it was finished, but not the end we could have known. 
Before the earth began to shake And the veil was torn What sacrifice was made As the heavens roared And we join with the heavens Every voice we sing Father, and I just thank you that we get to experience your presence. Even right now, I feel your presence in this space, and I thank you for being here with us. I thank you for how that changes me. 
and how it changes each one of us. Thank you for allowing us to experience you. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen and amen. Guys, can we just thank God for being here with us today? It's awesome to see all of you here today. As you're seated saying hi to someone, I'm getting mixed reviews on whether we like fall or not. So I'd love to share you to share your opinion. <laughs> it is good to see all of you here today. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here at the chapel. I bring up that fall conversation because we had a really fun event yesterday. If you were there, I got a few woos already. It was an awesome event. We had 700 people show up at our Grays Lake campus yesterday to celebrate Fall and Fall Fest. What that means is a ton of you were there and a ton of your neighbors were there. It was really a chance for us to invite people into our space to see that church may be a little different than what they think. It was a really cool event. So I thank you for allowing us to do that. It was a lot of fun. And I'm glad for you that we're able to join us. There's uh, one thing coming up soon, and it's in two weeks. We have a night of worship. If you haven't been to a night of worship, I always say you need to show up. Here's the reason you need to show up. Every week we get a chance to spend 20 to 24 minutes praising God. This is an extended period of time where we get to come and we get to cry out to our king. We get to thank him for who he is. We get to praise him for what he's done in our life. So I'd love for you to encourage you to be there because it's an extended period of time to do that. And it's life-changing. It changes me every time I show up because worship actually not only is glorifying to God, it changes who we are as a people. So I'd love to encourage you to be there. One of the things I wanna talk about about today's message, Scott's gonna give a message in a couple minutes. I just wanna tell you up front, there is a bit of mature content in that message. So if you have a kid who's in here, uh, we have Chapel Kids that's available. If you want to keep them in here, just know your dinner conversation may be different. Um, but I want to warn you on that on the front end. Feel free to do what you want with that, but I, I just want to give you a preem to that happening. Uh, also, I want to thank you. Um, you are a generous people. One of the things we do as the chapel is we partner with other organizations. And right now, one of those groups we're partnering with is Convoy of Hope. They're on the ground in the midst of this Israeli-Palestine conflict. And they're providing hope. They're providing resources to the individuals that are involved in that. So as we go into a message, I would love to spend a minute just praying for what's going on over there, thanking God for the resources he's given us to allow us to partner in that, and praying for the people that are over there trying to create relief in the midst of this uh, war. So Father, we come before you now, and Father, we ask your kingdom to break through in the midst of Palestine and Israel and the conflict that's been years over years. And I just pray that there's glimmers of your kingdom continuing to break through. Father, I pray that lives uh, are changed. I pray that you show up and people see you and experience you in new and ways, Father. And I pray for the groups that are there, such as Convoy. I just pray that you will give them your words to speak to the people, Father. And you'll give them resources that are immense so that they can really serve the people that have been torn apart by war. Father, I thank you for what you've done and your generosity to us as a church to allow us to partner with you in the things you're doing throughout this world. We love you and thank you for what you have in store for us today. I pray that we'll hear your voice through Scott. In your name we pray, amen. Good morning. Yeah. It's good to be here this morning with all of you guys and with everybody across our campuses and with chapel families online in this amazing fall day. Uh, start off with a weird question. You ready for a weird question? Here it is. Anybody out there ever done any scuba diving? Raise your hand. Anybody? Yeah. A few of us. Did you like it? Was it fun? Loved it. I loved it too. I I haven't done as much as I would like, but I am an avid lover of scuba diving. 
And one of the things that I love about it is how quiet it is under the water. Did you have that experience? It's like dead silent. It's like you're flying in a world that is brand new for you. It's adventurous. It is calm. It is beautiful. And, and I loved it. Now, scuba diving is not that hard. You can pick it up pretty quick. But there's a couple things that you need to be trained to do in order to do it safely. It's kind of like skydiving, right? There's stuff that the training probably is a good idea, like if you're going to go open water diving, right? And one of the things is you have to learn how to be able to surface from the bottom of the ocean without air. And so when I was learning how to do this, we were on a boat, and the instructor was there, and he had charts, and he had graphs, and he had diagrams, and he scientifically explained to us how this works, right? And he said, you know, at the bottom of the ocean, the pressure on your lungs is very much heavier than it is on the surface. So your lungs actually shrink. And so every breath that you take out of your tank is more air than you would take on the top. But here's the cool part. When you're out of air and you start to swim up, your lungs automatically inflate. So you can start exhaling and you literally will never stop exhaling the entire way all to the surface, even if you don't have a lot of air all the way at the bottom. And he had graphs and math and all kinds of things. And he said, do you believe me? And all of us said, sure. I'm, not, I'm on vacation. I'm not doing math, man. I'll, I'll believe you. You know what I mean? Like, sure. I believe you. You seem like a nice guy. You've probably done this before. Yeah, sure. I believe you. He goes, great. We're going to do it. What now? Like, I, what are we doing? So the whole class, we get our gear on. We drop down to about 105, 110 feet on the bottom of the ocean. Get your gear all squared away. And here's how it was going to work. He would pick someone. He'd go up. He'd put his hand on their shoulder. He'd do a thumbs up and you'd do a thumbs up back. And if you do a thumbs up back, he goes behind you and cuts your air off. So you can't get it. And you spit your regulator out and then you blow out whatever air you have. And then you start swimming up 105 feet with no air. Now, as luck would have it, I was the first one picked. Obviously, it was my leadership skills and acumen that was clearly visible in the class, right, as to why. Or I was expendable. I'm not entirely sure which, but either way, I'm gonna, I was the first one chosen. So we get down there, and I knew exactly what to do. I remembered everything I was told, and he came over, and he put his hand on my shoulder, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I knew what I was supposed to do. I was supposed to give him a thumbs up, right? But in that moment, I had a crisis. Here's what it was. I still trusted him, and I generally believed all his math and everything that he said, but I had become very emotionally bonded with my oxygen at that point in time. And it was a deep emotional experience for me. And I'm thinking to myself, what is more unnatural than getting rid of the air you need to breathe 100 and something feet under the water and imagining that you can exhale? I'm like, that is an unnatural act. No, thank you. I'm not going to do that, right? But he insisted. And so in that moment, I was faced with what I would call the difference between belief and trust. Did I believe it? Yeah, generally, right? It's math. I see it. I got it. But did I trust it? Was I going to put my life on the line? Was I going to believe it when it counted and get rid of my air and have 105 feet to go? That's the difference between belief and trust. This is something that Christians know a lot about, isn't it? In our lives, God comes along, and often from his word, we read things that God wants us to do. And sometimes they're not that hard, and we're like, yeah, that generally makes sense. Other times, it makes sense at first, but then we start to do it, and we're like, this is a super unnatural act. And it takes more than belief. It takes trust. Trust is intensely personal, right? Belief you can do at a distance, but trust is intensely personal. And honestly, you don't know if you can do it and you don't know if you were right until you do. And that's what the Bible calls faith. We've been in this journey over the past several weeks through the very first parts of the Bible and looking at how everything kind of got its start. And today, we're gonna pick up the story of our first ancestors where we kind of left them off. But today we're gonna watch them grapple with this thing called trust. 
And as we watch them navigate it, I don't think it's something that will feel foreign to us, but something that might feel deeply personal. Well, if you remember last week, we left them off in a pretty good place. They just got married, and they were naked and unashamed, right? That's not a bad place to be, right? So they were having fun in the garden. God's walking among them. Everything is awesome, right? That's chapter two. Humanity has begun. Life is good. This is chapter three. Verse one. And now the serpent was shrewder than any of the wild animals that the Lord had made. And I'm going to stop right there. That's an amazing introductory sentence, isn't it? Think about that. Who is the serpent? Like, we've never heard of a serpent before. We've been reading now for two chapters. There's no footnote on who this is. There's no sense of a backlog. There's just now a serpent that's in the story. Why is a serpent in the story? And why is he compared to the other animals? And he is shrewder than they are. In fact, we realize very quickly, the serpent talks. And not only does he talk, he talks in the queen's English. He's brilliant. And you start to realize something is deeply wrong here. Right? If there were theme music, it would sound like this. Dun, 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 right? And it would sound ominous because this has a sinister feel to it. You don't know at this point in the book who this is. Now, we do, right? Because we've read the rest of the book. This is none other than the prince of darkness himself in the guise of a simple animal. This is the angelic heavenly prince known as the Satan, the enemy, the adversary of God. The angelic figure that wanted to overthrow God, take his place, and enslave the universe. That's who this is. Now, we don't know that yet, but that's who has entered the garden. This is a moment that even if you've never read any of the Bible, you should feel nervous. This is a moment where we should feel apprehensive. This is a moment when everything has been going so well, and you just know in your gut it's going to take a turn. And this is what happens next. Goes up to the woman, says, is it really true that God said you must not eat from any tree in the orchard? And then in verse two, the woman said to the serpent, well, we may eat from the fruit of the trees of the orchard, but concerning the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the orchard, God said, you must not eat from it and you must not even touch it or else you'll die. And the serpent said to the woman, surely you are not gonna die For God knows that when you eat from it, your eyes will be open, and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree produced fruit that was good for food, attractive to the eye, and was desirable for making one wise, she took some of its fruit and ate it. And she gave some of it to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. We'll stop there. That's a master class in temptation, isn't it? Like, if you break this thing down, this is pretty genius. The servant does three things. The first thing in his conversation with the woman that he does is he refocuses her entirely. He gets her to forget everything that she's been given and focus all of her attention on the one thing she can't have. Right? Look at all the trees you can eat from. Look at all the vegetables you can have. Look at all the happy little animals that are in the garden you can pet, right? There are streams running, the sun is shining, God walks with you every day in the cool day. This is good. Life is good, man. But in one sentence, her focus was entirely shift from everything she had to the one thing she didn't. And then from there, he gets her to lust. And normally we reserve that word sexually, but lust just simply means to give in to your appetites. And what does she say? She's like, oh my gosh, that fruit, oh. Oh, I bet that's amazing to eat. Look at how beautiful it is. It's more beautiful than any other fruit. And you know what I bet? I bet if I ate it, it would make me wise. What is this woman talking about? She's never eaten it. She doesn't know anybody that's eaten it. How can you figure out that something's wise or not by looking at it from a distance? You have no idea what's happening. This is lust. You ever wanted to buy something you know you shouldn't? You don't have to raise your hand, right? You just nudge him if you're married to him, you know, pop, right? Ever, maybe it's an Apple Watch. You know, you really have an iPhone and an iPad already. You really don't need an Apple Watch, but oh my goodness, look at that. 
it is like perfect. It's like a little iPad on your wrist, right? What I could do with that that I can't do now, oh my goodness, that's amazing, right? It is the best thing ever. I bet it would make me wise, right? Or maybe it's the fishing pole at Bass Pro Shop, right? You got a fishing pole. You catch fish with it. But you take this fishing pole and you're like, ooh, right? Never held one like that before. Look at the whip in that, right? Oh my goodness, I would love that. Or maybe it's a sports car and you know that this is gonna really cost you but you've been looking at it in every ad, right? And now every time you're looking at anything on your iPad, the picture of the car comes up, right? And you're like, that is one amazing car, right? Look at the lines, it even looks good from the back, right? It is amazing. That's lust. Because here's why, how I know that. Go buy the fishing pole and tell me how it is in four weeks. Is it as amazing as it was in the store? How's that I, I watch working for you? It's kind of like your iPhone you wear on your wrist. And you're not nearly as excited about it anymore. The lust has subsided. This woman has no idea what this fruit's going to do. But she's convinced it's amazing. So she's refocused now to what she can't have. She's become absolutely lustful and convinced it's amazing, and now he introduces doubt. It's the coup de grace. He says, God is not telling you the truth. You're not gonna die. Oh my goodness. God's not protecting you. He's protecting himself. Because he knows once you eat it, you're gonna be like him. And you're going to be able to judge good and evil for yourself. You won't need him anymore. You'll be able to say what's right and wrong just like God does. You won't have to say, hey, God, is this right or is this wrong? You'll just say, I know, because I know the difference between good and evil and right and wrong, and I'll make the decision for myself, and you won't have to follow him anymore. Doesn't that sound amazing? Total freedom, doing whatever you want. You decide what's good. Wow, she says. Side note, this is a parenthetical comment. You really want to combat temptation? Here's a two-step process, gratitude and worship. Remember what you're blessed with. Be grateful for it and worship the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That counteracts this pretty fast, actually. Doesn't happen, though, unfortunately, right? Or we'd be in a much better place. We'd all be living in a garden right now. And so, but anyway, but as tragic as that moment is, the woman picks the fruit, takes a bite of it, and then there's the next sentence, which I find absolutely fascinating. She gave it to her husband, and this is the phrase I find absolutely fascinating. Who was with her? Husbands, help me out. If you were there with your wife and some serpent dude comes up and is kind of slithering around her and telling her all this stuff, what is your job? What's your job? Yell it out. This is not hard. What's your job? What's that? Kill a snake. Yeah, I would have done that too. I don't know if we have to go quite that far, but yes. Right? Maybe just a good beating would have, would have done it, but you know, here's the thing. Something as simple as this. Hey, our family, we stand with the Lord God. He's going to be here in a couple hours. Why don't you hang around and we'll ask him. Oh, you don't can't hang around? Sorry to hear that, right? And by the way, leave the missus alone from now on, right? That's what husbands do. Husbands step up, husbands lead. Husbands are strong in the midst of crisis. Adam did absolutely none of it. He was passive and permissive. And there we go. So, what comes next? This is verse seven. It says, the eyes of both of them were opened and they knew that they were naked. You ever know you were naked? It's not a good feeling. So they sewed fig leaves together, and they made coverings for themselves. And then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord moving about in the orchard in the breezy time of the day, and they hid from the Lord among the trees of the orchard. But the Lord called out to the man and said, where are you? And the man replied, I heard you moving about in the orchard, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And the Lord God said, well, who told you you were naked? Did you eat from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, the woman who you gave me, she gave me some fruit and I ate it. So the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you've done? And the woman replied, the servant tricked me and I ate. Classic passage, isn't it? So I bite the fruit 
in our culture, we always think it's an apple. In Middle Eastern cultures, they think it's a pomegranate, so we don't really know what it was, right? But whatever this fruit was, they bite it, and they eat it, and there's an immediate effect. Do you see that? Their eyes were open. The serpent didn't lie about that part. Their eyes were open, and they immediately knew that they were naked. What is going on here? The symbol of sin here is the fruit, right? They eat it. What happens when you eat something? You ingest it, and then you digest it. And it actually goes to every cell in your body and is used to make more stuff. It makes you. You are literally what you eat. So they ate sin, and sin is now not just a behavior that you do, but it's a condition that you are. And it is now spread all over, including to their intellect and everything else. And they now are different than they were before. And they know that they're naked. And they know it's a problem. They were naked and unashamed. Remember that? Naked and unashamed. Now they're naked and ashamed. What has changed? Shame. Because they were naked before. And they're naked now. But now they look inside themselves and they say, something is deeply wrong inside of me and I need to cover that up. There's an innate sense. I don't want you not only to physically look at me anymore naked, but I don't want you to emotionally look at me anymore naked. I don't want you to intellectually understand. I want to have a secret me that you never see because I'm ashamed of the me that is. This is a new idea. This was not created by God. This is guilt and shame. And so the first response of the first humans to their own sin is shame and guilt. And they're like, we gotta shut this boy down. I need clothes. So they make a clothes out of some leaves. Then they hear God coming and they know that he's gonna know, he's gonna see past these clothes because we didn't make good enough clothes. So they hide. And I love what God does, right? God knows what's happened. You think for one second, like, that God doesn't understand exactly what has taken place here? He's like a parent that walks into the kitchen, right? All the kids are standing there. You walk in the kitchen, they're like, you know. <laughs> and you're like, oh, what are you guys doing? Oh, you know, nothing. You know, dog's dead, everything else, you know, it was around, right? And you're like, nothing. They got chocolate all over their face and all over their clothes. Did you eat all the candy that we just got at the store? How did he know, right? <laughs> you ever have a parent moment like that, right? Well, God's doing that right now. He knows what's happened. He goes down. He goes, hey, where is everybody? He knows right where they are. Oh, we're over here. What are you doing hiding? Oh, we were naked. We we're kind of ashamed of that. Well, who told you you were naked? Oh, rats, right? Did you eat at a tree that I told you not to eat from? Well, maybe. And in that moment, what happens? They blame. Adam says, well, yes, I did. But it was the woman that you gave me. And honestly, if you think about it, isn't this really more your fault than my fault? Because if you hadn't given me the woman, it really wouldn't have happened and I'd have been fine. And frankly, we wouldn't be in this mess right now. So I kind of blame you, right? So he turns to the woman and says, what were you doing? And she says, well, the serpent tricked me. He turns to the serpent. The serpent's like, I got nothing, man, Right? All on me. And so in that moment, what do you have? Our first response to sin is to cover it up, to hide from God, to disengage with God, and to start blaming everybody but ourselves. Has that actually changed? I don't know about you, but when I fall to sin, that's my exact thing I want to do. I want to hide it. I don't want to talk about it, right? I want to be able to honestly disengage and put distance. Even though I need God more than ever, my propensity is to say, hey man, I just need some distance. And I start thinking about all the people that contributed to this other than me. And that's exactly what they do. So where does this bring us out? The Bible says that sin is a common problem to us all. Do you believe that? That means that you, me, your kids, my kids, our friends, our neighbors, people we love, people we don't like that much, all of them, all of us, you and me, have a sin problem. And we say, well, yeah, technically, that's true. Technically, we do. 
Well, technically we do, but also existentially we do. And let me tell you what I mean by that. If we were to take a video of your internal workings, and by that I don't mean your pancreas and kidneys, but the workings of your mind and your soul, and we were to make a low light reel of your very worst moments, just like the last six weeks, not just what you did or said, but what you thought, how good would that reel be to put up on these screens? That wouldn't feel very good, would it? Wouldn't feel good for me either, so I'm not separating myself in that. But here's what I am saying. Once you realize that, you realize that you're not just sinning technicality, like it's not a technicality. You're not guilty of moral jaywalking. There's a real sin problem in every single one of us. We have just gotten amazingly good at hiding, distancing, and blaming. Because the outside of us can look pretty good. And we can look like we don't sin at all if we get really good at this game. But inside, we know we actually have. And it's a huge deal, and it's a huge problem. Well, not only that, but this knowledge of good and evil thing affects us, and it gives us the propensity to redefine good and evil for ourselves. So it's not just that we get something wrong or that we sin or we do something bad, but we have ingested the knowledge of good and evil, and and that means we take over God's job as king and judge, and we start saying what's good and bad. And we immediately turn on God, right? That's called idolatry, by the way. We're made in the image of God. We return the favor, and we make God in our image. That's what idolatry is. We make God in our image. We can say, uh, God is the God of my preferences and priorities. I was talking to a lady that had a really upset with me on one of the sermons I preached a year or so ago. And in that, she kept saying a phrase. My God would never do that. My God would never say that. My God, my God, my God. And I finally, at the end, I said, I don't know that I know him. I don't think I know your God. Because this had become an intensely personal God for her, who had embodied all the characteristics that she liked, and she had jettisoned the characteristics that she didn't like. Other times, we make up a national God, a God of our nation who's for us and against everybody else. Other times, we just simply believe there's not a God at all. And we redefine the universe without him. Other times, we redefine not just God, but how God has made us. Gender and sexuality. You know, we live in a time when the story we talked about last week of male and female having a sexual robust life inside of marriage is not the majority story of our culture. Right now, the story of our culture isn't bounded by marriage. And you can have sexual relationships, frankly, anywhere you want. And you can be told that. And it's a rewriting of the narrative. People are very open to understanding sex to start very young, sex to not be bounded by marriage. We're redefining gender dramatically. Where now in our society, it's not male and female, but there's an entire spectrum of gender. In addition to that, there's an entire reality of sexuality that's being rewritten. Your kids hear it all the time in school. It's on the news. And in fact, it has become so concretized in our society to disagree with it has a penalty attached to it. That's redefining the knowledge of good and evil. We redefine it for relationships. Instead of love as the currency of relationships, control becomes the currency of relationships. And we feel like because everybody's a sinner and we know that about each other, we need to protect ourselves from each other. And so we institute systems of control, systems that keep each other at a distance, systems that disempower other people, that keep them just weak enough that I can trust being around them, ensuring that I get what I need before you get what you need so that I'm sure that I'm okay even if you're not. That's a really different way to do relationships than what we learned last week. That's part of the knowledge of good and evil. And it has effects, right? It affects us. How many of you guys ever saw Lord of the Rings? Anybody ever see that one? It's an oldie but a goodie. Yeah, a bunch of you. If not, you ought to watch that one. Pretty good. Tolkien was a Christian, the guy that wrote all the books and, and in that. And he wanted to come up with a way to talk about sin. 
And he thought about it, and the way he came up with it, it's pretty genius, really. Uh, he made it into a ring. And this ring, right, is the ring of power. And whoever has the ring, somehow circumstances start to line up for them. And in addition to that, they can be invisible, right, whenever they put the ring on and have that power that no one else has to either get out of trouble or do something or spy on people or do whatever you want to do. And it's this promise of greatness and power and delivering what you desire. But what happens to the people who put the ring on? It starts to damage them, doesn't it? There's this figure called Gollum who has worn the ring for hundreds of years, and he's physically a shriveled up mess of who he was. He's lived an unnaturally long life, but it's destroyed his body. He's relationally completely isolated because he doesn't trust anybody, and he's completely paranoid. And he's emotionally just destroyed. And the same thing happens to Frodo, the lead character, as he starts to have this ring, even for a short period of time. But what's even more than that is while the ring promises freedom, it delivers bondage, doesn't it? It binds you to the dark Lord. And you find yourself, even though you're trying to do what you want to do, you're, you're ending up being led to him and led into circumstances, not of your own creation, but his. And Tolkien felt like that was the best way to talk about this thing called sin. Because sin is something that gets in us and twists us into people we never wanted to be or intended to be. It twists our circumstances. It promises so much and delivers something else. And that's how he wanted to try to help us understand that. When you think about the world around us, we talked about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. It's horrible, isn't it? I was listening to the news this morning. There was a mass shooting in Chicago. Um, I look at the level of crime that is, is going on right now. I look at the, the number of abuse victims that there are in America right now. I look at poverty that's here and how bad that is. I look at still how racism is plaguing us. I look at all these things. How many of those things are the result of sin, do you think? Yes. When we look at our lives and we look at relationships that are shattered, right, that we wanted to, like, go the right way, and they just kind of are bent off. When we look at the conflict that we're in, when we look at even the condition of our own heart, our lack of peace and the presence of anxiety and maybe depression and all of those things, how much of that is the result of sin? All of it. That literally means that there's good news and bad news. The good news is, honestly, humanity really has one problem. It's called sin. The bad news is, it's a really bad problem. And we can't fix it. We can't fix it. Our best attempts are like fig leaves, and they don't cut it. The reality is, you can't work your way out of it. You can't do more good things than bad things. That somehow doesn't erase the hurt that's already there. There's nowhere you can really hide from God. There's no blame that we can really completely blame on other people. You can't legislate sin away. You can't put enough economic resources behind it to overcome it. You can't fix it. It's, it's honestly like a spiritual cancer. It's not a disease. Cancer is not a disease you catch, Right? It's when your own cells go haywire and they mutate and multiply. That's what sin is. It's not an external thing that is coming into your life. It is something that now is you and is a mutated you that is multiplying in you and you can't fix it. What do we do? Well, if you read on in the passage, God addresses each party and the sin that they've had I'll let you do that. We're gonna, we'll address that in the podcast this week, but we'll let you read that one for now. But then God does something completely unexpected in verse 21. This is what it says. The Lord God made garments from skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. We'll stop there. Did you catch that? God clothed Adam and Eve. You tracking? 
they could not successfully clothe themselves, but God could successfully clothe them. God did not use vegetation as they did to clothe them. He used skin. Where, pray tell, do you think the skin came from? He called over one of the animals that Adam had named, Binky for our purposes, right? Probably a lamb. And he killed it right in front of him. And he tore the skin off, dripping with blood. And he put it on them. And he covered them in the skin and the blood of the skin. How would that have felt, do you think? Never seen death before. I think the screams, the brutality would have been horrible. It would have been traumatizing, right? And you say, why in the world would God do that? Well, because I think, one, he wanted to make a point. Sin is horrible. And the solution to sin is equally horrible. Second point, you can't do this for yourself. You can't fix it. Somebody's going to die. It's going to be me. It's going to be my blood eventually that covers you and gets you out of the mess you made. That's a powerful thought, isn't it? This hearkens to the sacrifice ultimately that Jesus would make for us and that his blood, not ours, is the blood that will get demanded to pay for the price of sin. And he then expels them from the garden. Why? To punish them? No. Because he doesn't want to be from the tree of life. Why? Because he doesn't want us to live forever in a sinful state. It's actually mercy. And he drives them out into the world where we live now, in a fallen place, where we find ourselves in the wake of their decision thousands and thousands of years later. And for us, living in a fallen world, sure doesn't look like a garden. Living in a fallen world has a lot of frustration involved, fear involved, mess involved. Death is commonplace for us. Death has become very well understood for us. Surprising to them, it's not surprising to us. We live in a world of beauty and brokenness, both. The remnants of creation still exist. You can go and look at an ocean and there's an awe and a wonder that you'll have as you do, not just of the ocean, but of the one who made it. You can scuba dive with me someday down in a coral reef and you can look at all the fish and you'll be in wonder of the beauty of creation. But we're also very aware of brokenness, aren't we? that things don't work the way they're supposed to work. And really bad things can happen to people who don't deserve it. Sometimes, honestly, life doesn't even make sense. And the tension is seeing our world, ourselves, our life in both terms of beauty and brokenness. And the temptation is to only see it in terms of one and not the other. See, we're tempted at times to see our world and ourselves only in terms of beauty. And if you do, you'll explain everything in the world by the creation of God. And you'll say, well, this is just the world that God made. This is how God made it. And you'll celebrate it as creation. When in reality, part of it has been created and part of it has been marred and broken by sin. And there's things we don't celebrate. And there's things we do. The second is we're tempted to entirely be mistaken to believe that only brokenness is what we see. And when we're tempted to do that, we're tempted to see people as their sin. We're tempted to just label them as what's wrong with them and condemn them and dismiss them and forget that they are still made in the image of God and that they are still beautiful to him. It's only when we can live in the tension 
of brokenness and beauty that can happen. If you've been at our church a long time, it was probably eight, nine years ago I told a story, and I'm going to share it again here because I think it fits really well. Um, I was, uh, one, of the, one of the things that I will do is I have uh, a group of friends who do what I do for a living who are senior pastors of decent-sized churches and from all around the country. And when I'm in one of their towns or when we get together in a, in a town, I'm doing this in a few weeks in Dallas, here we have a ritual, here's what it is. We'll get together for dinner and we catch up on life, how our family's doing, what our kids are up to, all that kind of thing, right? And we just kind of go around the table and we have that conversation. And then we go out for a cigar and we talk about God. Now, if that is horrifying to you that your pastor actually goes out for a cigar, I am sorry, but you'll get over it, all right? And so here's, <laughs> here's, here's what we do, right? It's an occasional thing, right? Whatever. So, so I'm in San Diego. I'm with a friend of mine. We have dinner, caught up, and I said, hey, where do, you, where do you want to go get a cigar? And so he looks up a place. Neither of us had been. We go to this place. We go inside, and we're, we go to the humidor. We're going to get a cigar. Never been there before. We're talking away, not paying attention to anybody. We come out, going to pay for it. We go up to the bar, and there's two ladies sitting here at the bar, and we hadn't really given notice to them. But one of them turns around, and they're both very, very drunk. And one of them turns around and to my friend and says, hey, I've never seen you in here before. What are you doing here? And my friend, who's the, literally the nicest guy in the world, like he is the best, he's, he's the most godly man I've ever known in my life. He really, really is. He looks at her and goes, oh, we're pastors and we're here to talk about God. I'm thinking, probably wouldn't have led with that one, but yeah, okay, great. Uh, we're pastors and we're here to talk about God. And man, did that get it going. They stood up and lit us up. Who do you think you are to come in here and tell us what you think? Who do you think you are? This isn't for you, this place. And I'm looking, I'm like, what are you talking about? I came in to get a cigar. And I looked around, and for the first time I realized, I looked at the decor, I looked at the folks, and I realized this is an LGBTQ plus cigar bar. <laughs> okay? And very proud, very celebratory of the culture. And if I would have just paid attention, it would have been very obvious to me, right? Nobody was hiding anything. I just wasn't paying attention. And all of a sudden, we were now the object of wrath. And it went on and on and on, and I, I just kind of stood there. My friend was very nervous and wanted to leave. And I'm like, let's not. I just felt God was doing something. And so the owner comes over and says, hey, you guys just go sit in the corner and leave everybody alone. I'm like, sure, happy to do that. So we go over, sit in the corner, start our God conversation. About 10 minutes later, these women come over, and they're even angrier. They sit down at our table, and they just start right back where they left off. So I'm sitting there, and I'm praying. I'm like, God, I don't know what you want me to do. And in this, um, one of the women finally said this. She goes, I know who you are. I'm like, you do? Like, I know who you are. I said, how do you, I, I don't know, I, have I met you? She said, no, but I know who you are and I know what you do. She said, my dad was an elder in a Southern Baptist church in Alabama. And every single Sunday night before the elders meeting, he would take me to McDonald's and get me a Happy Meal right before he molested me in the back seat of the car. I know you're God. I know who you are. I know what you're really like. So you can just, and I'll save you the rest. And I heard that. And I looked at her and I said, you know, I've been confused up to this point as to why I'm here. But now I know. She said, why? You're going to condemn me? You're going to tell me I need to get saved? You know, I said, no, I'm going to apologize to you. I'm going to do what somebody should have done a long time ago. And I said, on behalf of Jesus and his church, what happened to you is wrong. And it should have never happened. And I'm terribly sorry. And I said, you have my deepest sympathy and greatest regret. And they had told me that they were pregnant earlier. I didn't talk to them about alcoholism and pregnancy. I thought that was a conversation for another day. But... Um, 
I looked at her and I said, you know, I said, you're gonna have a baby. And I said, I would love to just pray for your delivery and the health of your baby. Would you be up for that? I said, yeah. To my shock, they grabbed my hands and bowed their heads and shut their eyes. And the one woman turned to me and reminded me that's how you have to pray, so I did the same. And I, I <laughs> put, put my head down and closed my eyes as well. And so we were all closing our eyes and holding our hands, and I was praying for her baby, and I was praying that Jesus would become real to them in a way that they would know how much he loves them. And when the prayer was over and we let go hands, I looked around, and there was about 20 people that had come over praying with us. And I share that to say this. Now, did we, all, did we solve all the problems? No. Do we now all believe exactly the same thing? No. But did we change the conversation? Yeah. Because now the conversation is coming from a place of compassion and grace and the mutual understanding of all of our brokenness. I'm not a not broken person going in there sitting down with broken people. I am 100% as broken as anybody in that place. I approach this as somebody who is deeply broken and cannot fix my brokenness. I, am, I have spiritual poverty. I have nothing of myself I can give another person. I can't fix you. I can't fix me. And the only answer I have to that is Jesus. And Jesus is an equal opportunity lover of people. And here's the truth. You and I don't look that different to him than they do. We have preference our own sin type. Every single person goes light on themselves and heavy on everybody else. If you don't know that, that's Matthew 7. You can read that one. Speck in a log, right? Here's the point. In that, I'm not making excuses for brokenness. I'm not celebrating sin. Mine, theirs, anybody. But I am recognizing it. And I'm realizing I'm in a place that I can't fix this. I'm not an expert that's coming in here to somehow give you a different life. I just want to talk about Jesus. And I'm in as much need as you. And in that moment, I also think that God is a God of inclusion. People ask me, you know, would you ever want, you know, LGBTQ, gender fluid people coming to church? Yeah, all of them. Why? Because I think Jesus loves them and I think there's beauty in who they are and I'm not gonna judge them by their sexuality. I'm gonna judge them as made in the image of God and let Jesus figure the rest out with them. I don't need to be their judge. I need to point them in the right direction and be able to love them as best I can. And if they can connect to Jesus, Jesus and them will figure it out. What does that do? Well, I think it brings us back where we started. I think living in the tension of beauty and brokenness, this idea of trusting Jesus, his wisdom, this is tough, isn't it? Like we got this book that we read, right, called the Bible. It's filled with wisdom. And the whole point of reading the book is to take the knowledge of good and evil that we have and how we think things are right and wrong and we lay it up against the book. And we say, I'm going with the book over myself. And that's real easy as long as the book sounds good to us. But once the book doesn't sound that good, it's a super hard thing to do, isn't it? And in addition to that, we have to lay our life up against Jesus. And we have to say, I can't get myself out of this. I got nothing, man. I need you. It's not a nice to have. Like, I can't live 10 more seconds without you kind of thing. It's kind of like standing on the bottom of an ocean with no air in your lungs. And you have to decide right then and there what you're gonna do. Are you going to trust, which is very different than generally believe? Are you gonna lay your life alongside the life of Jesus? 
and say, I'm going with Jesus. I don't have all the answers. I don't know how it entirely turns out. I frankly don't even know the middle of the story. But I'm going with it. And I'm going to do something that is radically unnatural, which is give up my own authority and control and allow him to be the king of my life and give up any sense of self-righteousness or worth on my own and allow him to be my worth, allow him to be my treasure, my savior. And if you're willing to do that, there's a life. The Bible doesn't end in Genesis 3. The beauty's coming. The power's coming. And this serpent character doesn't get the last laugh. Jesus does. I think there's an invitation in this for all of us. I think for some of us, we've been going easy on ourselves with some sin. It's certainly possible. We've been glossing over it, and you know which one I'm talking about, right? The one that you have not wanted to think about, but for every one individually that is. I think God might want you to actually just lay it right down for him and talk about it with him. Have an honest conversation that might start the pathway to setting us free from some of those things that we don't have to live with. Lust can imprison us, can't it? Lust to material things, lust to our own appetites, our own sexuality. We're so tempted to make our, our, our lusts the whole story and say, how can I possibly overcome that because it feels so big? It's kind of like the story of the rider and the elephant. And you realize the rider may think he's guiding the elephant, but at any point in time, the elephant decides where the elephant goes. And they did a psychological study and they found out that the vast majority of people are governed by their appetites. And their intellect is like the rider on the appetite of the elephant. And the more intelligent you are, you're not more rational. You just have a greater capacity to rationalize the direction you already want to go. And the only way to fix that is to get off the elephant and get in front of the Lord and reset. Others of us, we've been mad at some people, man. We've been PO'd. We've been holding a lot against them. We may need to let that go. Let me rephrase that. We need to let that go. We think somehow we can drink bitterness and it hurts the people we're mad at. It doesn't. It hurts us. I know people who've been legitimately hurt and have drank a case of bitterness and the bitterness is killing them way more than the hurt that they had. And if that's you, God wants to set you free of the bitterness today. Some of us have been hiding from God, even though we know we can't, we're trying to do it. Been hiding in the last row. I know how that works back there, by the way. <laughs> Some of us um, have been struggling. Struggling with doubt. We're struggling to believe that God's who he says he is. We're struggling to believe that the life that he gives is actually as good as what it's built. And another narrative has come into our life and it's captured part of our heart and it's made it really hard to trust God fully in the way we want to. I get it. This is an opportunity to lay that down. It's an opportunity to stop trying to be our own king or queen and say what's right or wrong. It's the opportunity to stop trying to save ourselves or preserve ourselves or control our life and give it away. And maybe that's the first time you've ever heard that. Maybe it's the 101st. Maybe you've done it, but you need to do it again. And if that's where you are, I think the power of Genesis 3 isn't about sin, though there's a power in sin. There's a greater power in God. And no matter how deep the hole is that you've dug, no matter what you've done, it's not so deep. God can't find you. God can't reach you. And God can't help you. And even if you've forgotten about him, he's never forgotten about you. He knows your name. 
He has seen every hurt you've ever had. And he has shed tears over you because he treasures you. And right now is about taking a step toward him and trusting him for the middle of the story. And if you wanna do that, let's do it together. Amen? Father, there are so many issues that are hard for us that feel so much bigger than our minds can grasp. God, we sometimes think we know right and wrong. And then there's other times we hear stuff and we're like, I have no idea. Lord, the problems of the world seem so big and we feel so small. Lord, the problems in our life hurt us and scare us. And Lord, every part of us doesn't want to do this unnatural act of trusting you, but we want to hang on to control because it feels smart. God, help us to exhale. Help us to exhale faith, Lord. Fill up our spirit like you fill up our lungs with your goodness and your love and your peace and your joy in the midst of all we're going through. And Lord, right now, Lord, for some of us, we just say, we want you to be king. We want you to be the leader. And we want you to be our savior. We want you to be the one who fixes us. And Lord, we hold that out to you and we cry for help. In your holy name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thanks. Guys, I want to thank you for joining us this week. I pray that as you go this week, that you will take that time to experience God, connect with him, and see how he speaks into your life. We're going to leave this space open. We're going to invite a prayer team up. We're going to do a little bit of worship. I love for you to stay. If God's doing something in your life, don't run away from that. But be dismissed and have a great week with God. and breathe on this heart that is now yours. You can have it all, Lord. Every part of my world. Take this life and breathe
joy I found. And oh, the joy I found. Surrendering my crown at the feet of the King who surrendered everything. And oh, life and breathe on this heart that is now yours. This is our prayer.
everything, everything. Take this life and breathe on. This heart is gone. And today, Lord, we say we trust you. Trust in your goodness. We trust in your faithfulness. We trust that you know what's best. And we say yes to the invitation and the challenge to live in the tension of the beauty and the brokenness of the world as it is. We ask for the grace to do that by the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for your presence with us as we seek to live in that tension. And we ask that you'd help us to represent you and your heart in that tension, Lord, to see your kingdom come and your will be done on the earth as it's done in heaven. So we pray all this in Jesus' mighty name. If you're getting prayer, please continue. We're here for as long as you need it. God bless you guys. Have a wonderful week.